Hello there and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about the transition elements. Now in this video we will be looking at the simple properties of the transition elements. Then we will move on to compare the transition elements with other elements from different groups. And finally we will look at some special properties that transition metals and their compounds have. First of all then, let's take a look at the transition elements themselves. Now the transition elements are the middle block of the periodic table, and you can see them here. And I've drawn them here with their symbols, but you can see that these are maybe what you might think of as the typical metals. We have got gold, we've got silver, we've got copper, and then we've got iron, and we've got nickel and we've got chromium. So these are maybe typical metals, oh, and platinum as well. And then there will be some others that you maybe haven't heard of. I want to just outline a few very simple properties that these transition elements have got. So they all have similar properties to each other and that's why they are always talked about in the same terms. Now, first of all, they are very dense. Imagine holding a lump of iron, it would feel very heavy in your hands. Not only are they very dense, they are usually very strong and they are usually shiny. And you can certainly polish them to a really good shine and they will keep that shine for quite a long time. And last of all, they are very good conductors and that is not just of heat, but also electricity too. And I don't think any of those will come as surprises to you. So iron is very strong, so it's often used in bridges and construction. Copper conducts electricity, so it's often used in electrical wiring. It conducts heat, so it's often used in saucepans. And iron is used in saucepans too. And platinum, gold and silver, they are not very quick to corrode, so they're used in jewellery. Now before I go too much further, I should probably point out what you've maybe already noticed, which is that I've only got the eight columns of this middle block of the periodic table highlighted. There are some missing elements on here. And that's because there are a number of different definitions of transition metals and a lot of them don't include zinc as being a transition metal and some of them don't include scandium either and so that's why I'm only considering titanium through to copper and the two rows beneath those elements on there. Now the good news for you is that on your syllabus it is really really clear that you need to know what transition elements are like and you need to be able to give examples of the properties of transition metals and they name the ones that you are going to be asked about. You're going to be asked about chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel and copper. So this is the selection that the examiners will be asking you about in your tests. And so having an appreciation that these other elements that I've got in blue are transition metals is useful. They might ask you about these properties of these elements, knowing that you ought to know what they are in general. But I think the vast majority of exam questions are likely to focus on that row of six from chromium through to copper. Now, I've already said that the transition elements are metals with similar properties. But what I haven't said yet is that these properties are dramatically different to other elements that are considered to be metals, particularly those of group one, the alkali metals. And I've just filled in the table with the alkali metals in here. So those are the common comparison group that you might be asked about in an exam. And you need to be able to describe the differences in these properties comparing group one to the transition metals. So first up, in terms of physical properties, the alkali metals, if you remember when you put them into water, these metals float in water. And that's because these are low density. In contrast, the transition metals, as I've already said, they are high density. 
And related to that, when you put the alkali metals into water, you will often cut them with a knife. And the reason that you do that when you're showing the alkali metals is that you can show the tarnishing effect on the cut surface. But it's also a nice contrast with the transition metals because the transition metals are hard substances. And so a hard substance is one that will resist forces that maybe are scratching it, denting it, making any permanent cuts in it. So this is the ability to resist cutting or shape change. And as well, transition metals, as we've already said, they're strong, which means that they're going to resist any snapping. So they don't break easily. Which again is a contrast with the alkali metals. So where a piece of sodium, when you put it into water, will float because it's low density, something like a piece of nickel will sink in water because it is high density. Once you've put the alkali metal into water, they react very violently. Whereas the transition metals will sink and they will react very, very slowly at all. In fact, in this block of transition metals, really iron is actually the one that will react fastest with water and this will only react slowly. And something like manganese and nickel, they don't react at all. Other comparisons with the transition metals is that the alkali metals have got very low boiling points and melting points where the transition metals have got very high melting and boiling points. So for instance, lithium's melting point is 181 degrees C and potassium's is 63 degrees C, whereas iron is close to 1500 degrees C as its melting point. And copper is still quite high, it's just over 1000 degrees C. So you can see that they are much higher melting points for the transition metals than for the alkali metals. And I've mentioned reactions with water. The reactions generally with oxygen and with group seven elements are really fast for the alkali metals and really slow for the transition metals if they react at all. So silver, gold, platinum, these are very unreactive. But something like iron will react slowly with water and with chlorine and oxygen. Whereas these alkali metals, as you will know from other lessons, these alkali metals react really quickly with water and chlorine and oxygen. So to sum up these comparisons, if we look at the alkali metals compared to the transition metals, the density of the alkali metals is low, whereas the transition metals is high, which is why they sink in water. The melting point of the alkali metals is low, whereas the transition metals is high. It does depend what you're comparing it to. 180 degrees for lithium is still quite high, but it is comparatively low. And then the hardness of alkali metals is once again low, and the transition metals have got a high hardness. It's very hard to change their shape by scratching or cutting. And last of all, the reactivity for the alkali metals is very high, and the transition metals is very low. The transition metals include some of the least reactive metals in the periodic table. Moving on to look at some of the more particular and specific properties that transition metals can have. The first one is that when they form ions by giving away their outer shell electrons, they form positive ions and transition metals can form positive ions with more than one charge, depending on how many electrons they give away. Now, probably the most common one of these that you're likely to encounter is iron. Now, iron can form Fe2+, Fe is the symbol for iron, or it could form Fe3+, where it has either given away two electrons to become 2+, or three electrons to become 3+. Now, the other clever thing about these is that these often have different colours, 
Now, if you've got a solution that contains iron 2 plus, it is often a green color, whereas iron 3 plus is more of a sort of rusty yellow or orange color. And in fact, the color of rust comes from the iron 3, which is present in the iron oxide, which is what rust is. Other transition elements that have got different charges that are slightly less common that you're going to encounter, copper can form copper 2 plus or copper 1 plus. And the copper 2 plus is that characteristic blue color that you'll know from copper sulfate crystals. It's the copper 2 plus that gives it that lovely blue color. And then cobalt, cobalt can form two ions in the same sort of way as iron, cobalt 2 plus or cobalt 3 plus. And last of all that I'll mention is chromium. Chromium can form a number of different ions, but chromium 2 plus and chromium 3 plus are quite common ions for chromium. Now, because they form different ions, it's actually quite important for us to be able to tell one from the other. And so what we usually do is we use a Roman numeral. And so we would refer to iron 3 plus as iron 3 in Roman numerals, often without the horizontal um, above and below, but sometimes we include it. And so if we had iron 3 plus and we had chlorine, we would call it iron 3 chloride. And we can also have iron 2 plus, which is iron 2 chloride. And they would have different formulae depending on whether it was iron 2 or iron 3. Because when you combine ions, remember they cancel out the overall charge. So Fe3 plus and Cl1 minus, you combine them together and you get the formula FeCl3. Because we need three of these chlorines to cancel out the positive charge of the iron 3 plus. Whereas if you have iron 2 chloride, iron is only 2 plus this time, chloride is of course still 1 minus, and this time you only need one more chloride to cancel out the positive charge. So the formula of iron 2 chloride is FeCl2. So it's really important to know what this notation means. That 3 in Roman numerals means that the iron is a 3 plus charge. So it always refers to the positive charge on there. The second property to discuss about transition metals is colour. Transition metal compounds are very colourful and they've been being used for many, many years, thousands of years, to give wonderful colours for dyes, for clothing and other substances too. Before we even knew what a transition metal was, these were being used. The colour that forms depends on the transition metal ion that they are using and it depends on the charge of that transition metal as I've already mentioned. For instance, if we just take a look at a few transition metal compounds, potassium manganate is a lovely strong purple colour. You might have come across this in physics when you demonstrate convection currents. You can add a little bit of potassium manganate 7 to some water and warm it up and you can look at the movement of this purple colour in a beaker or in a tube. Potassium dichromate is an orange colour. And this is when the chromium has got a charge of plus 6. Notice here the potassium manganate 7 on there. That's the manganese with a 7 plus charge. The potassium dichromate is a 6 plus. If those transition metals change their charge from 6 to something else or 7 to something else, that purple colour or that orange colour is going to change. And I've already mentioned that copper 2 sulphate is a nice blue colour on there. And in fact, it's not the sulfate, like I say, copper 2 chloride will also be a blue colour. But copper isn't always blue, it can go green when it gets weathered over time. So lots of ancient statues that were blue have turned green. If you've got copper on the outside of your house, it might have changed colour slightly to a more green colour or a blue-green colour. Transition metals, like I say, they are not just limited to these colours that I've mentioned. We have them in pottery dating back from ancient Rome. The glazers were often transition metal compounds 
and precious gems like sapphires that are blue and emeralds that are green, they take their colour from transition metal compounds that are contained within them. The last property that I want to discuss in this video is the property of catalysis. Now transition metals and transition metal compounds in some cases, they make good catalysts. Now catalysts are really important in industrial processes. That means processes that make large scale amounts of a particular product. And what catalysts do is they speed up chemical reactions. And that means we get more of our product without having to wait a long, long time. Not only do they speed up chemical reactions, they don't get used up themselves. And so that means that we can keep using our transition metal catalyst again and again and again without having to pay more each time. So we've paid for our catalyst. We can keep using it again and again because it is not being used up. I'd like to make a link here with the rates of reaction topic since we're talking about catalysts. They speed up the rate of reaction without being used up. They do this by providing an alternative route or an alternative reaction pathway, it's sometimes mentioned as. And this alternative pathway has got a lower activation energy. And so what that means is a greater proportion of the chemical reactants will have the minimum amount of energy needed to start the reaction going, which is what the activation energy means. Now there are in fact only two catalysts mentioned on the GCSE chemistry course. And they are, first of all, iron in the Harbour process. And the Harbour process, you'll learn more about in a different topic, but this is where you make ammonia which is a vital ingredient when making things like fertilisers and explosives. It's all got all manner of different uses. And then the second catalyst is far more specific in its use, and that's the nickel catalyst. And the process there is used to hydrogenate alkenes. And what that hydrogenation means is turn double bonds in hydrocarbons such as in ethene here, into single bonds between carbon atoms. And it does that by adding extra hydrogen to the molecule. So you can see that on the left-hand side, ethene contained only four hydrogen, whereas ethane on the right-hand side has got six because there are two extra hydrogen atoms in this molecule. And that uses the catalyst nickel to speed up the process of adding hydrogen on. Okay, that's the end of this video about transition metals. I hope it was useful, and I'll see you next time for a video about the halogens in Group 7. Goodbye.